Så där. Varmt, varmt välkomna till detta webbinar om AI, artificiell intelligens, med svenska statistikförmedlet och ingen mindre än Olle Häggström. Jag heter Mattias Strandberg och är sekreterare och eventsamordnare på Svenska Statistikfrämjandet. Och det är otroligt roligt, det här är vårt allra första webbinar som har närmare 100 personer anmäla. Otroligt roligt tycker vi. Så vi hoppas att ni tycker att det här är lika spännande som vi också. Vi ska idag få lyssna till Olle Hengström som är professor i matematisk statistik vid Chalmers tekniska högskola. Och dessutom forskare på Institutet för framtidsstudier. Innan vi släpper in Olle så tänker jag bara ta lite housekeeping här. Det här webbinariet spelas in och kommer därför att finnas tillgängligt även efteråt för den som vill se det eller vill dela med sig till några kollegor eller motsvarande som inte har möjlighet att vara med. Det kommer finnas på statistikförmedlets hemsida efteråt. Har ni frågor som dyker upp under webbinariet som ni vill ställa till Olle så kan ni antingen skriva dem i chatten eller så finns det en funktion för att höja er hand. Då försöker vi hålla lite koll så vi ser om det är någon som har höjt sin hand och som då vill komma in. Vi kommer att ta alla frågor på slutet så att vi då bjuder in er till, till frågor då. Då kommer jag försöka moderera det så att vi får bra frågor så att vi inte ställer samma fråga flera gånger. Under webbinariet så kommer ni alltså att vara eh, mutade, det vill säga att ni kommer inte att kunna prata och vi ser också gärna att ni håller era videokameror avstängda. Jag tror inte att ni ens kan slå på dem. Eh, men med detta så lämnar jag nu över till Olle Hengström som ska prata om AI Alignment, Embedded Agency and Decision Theory. Varmt välkommen Olle. Tack så väldigt mycket. Väldigt, eh... Kul att vara här. Um, jag blev lite, lite konfus av att, att du ger introduktionen på svenska här för att jag var inställd på att prata engelska. Jag tror det så det är annonserat. So should I take this in English or do you prefer otherwise? Yes. Uh, oj, det var en uh, bra fråga. Um, jag tror vi, uh, vi körde nog på engelska för det är det mm. du har planerat för. Exakt. Uh, So, uh, let's switch it over to English and yes. here we go. So, so at you, as you can see on this introductory slide, the date is slightly inaccurate, uh, March 18, which is uh, uh, when the Statistics Unit had its annual meeting and I was invited to speak there. And then suddenly COVID-19 showed up its ugly face uh, and, and uh, uh, my talk was canceled. But I'm very happy to be able to Now, uh, many of you, I suspect, uh, uh, know me um, from my work uh, in the uh, fundamental theory of mathematical statistics. But in recent years, uh, I've been doing more and more stuff that, uh, that is not typically representative of what a professor of mathematical statistics does. So and you see some of that uh, here on this. Um, slide, uh, stuff having to do with uh, existential risk, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. Uh, but so what I'm going to do uh, uh, partly in this talk is, is to uh, show you uh, every now and then uh, glimpses from uh, what I've been doing in these last few years. One of these is to, Could you yes? try holding the mix slightly closer to your mouth so we yeah. can um, I don't know how to arrange that. Uh, do you have any advice? Well, this is the type of mic I have. Okay, uh, if you could just uh, maybe um, hang it on your uh, ear and it goes across your mouth. Um, oh, never mind. Let's, let's keep it going. <laughs> is it a way to just turn up the volume? We'll, we'll go with that. Okay. Keep going. Uh, okay. Okay. So this is my essay in, in the uh, latest uh, Krim Tensen uh, on AI-utveckling and uh, och forskarens ansvar. 
And uh, I suppose many of you uh, have seen that. Um, this is not the stuff I'm going to talk about, but if anyone wants to discuss it, I'm happy uh, at the end to, to, to take questions on that as well. There's another glimpse. This is uh, from a, a PhD course I gave at Chalmers uh, in the fall of 2016 uh, on the fundamentals of Bayesian uh, reasoning. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about some of the core stuff that we came to understand uh, during that course. So first of all, I want to say that I distinguish between uh, Bayesian reasoning and Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics is a particular way of doing science. Uh, Bayesian reasoning is a much, much more ambitious uh, project, which tells us uh, how to, it's, it's a proposal for how to live uh, our lives in an epistemically uh, correct uh, way. And uh, doing science, so Bayesian statistics is, is just uh, a part of that. Uh, the uh, course was to a large uh, part based on this book by Itzhak Gilboa, a wonderful book treating a beautiful body of 20th century work. Uh, D.P. Ramsey, von Neumann, Morgenstern, with Nefti, Savage, and others, leading up to the conclusion that, that the uh, plausible assumptions imply that a rational uh, agent should have probability distributions for, for what the world is like. So you go around carrying your own subjective probability distribution for that. One should have a utility function and one should choose actions that maximize. Olle, skulle du att hålla micken upp till munnen? Vi får flera ja. som upplever att de inte har det ordentligt. Ja, okej. Okay. Så mycket. Uh, ja, ja. So, so, so what this theory leads to are these three things. Uh, and, and it's based on what I call several plausible assumptions. And just to give a flavor of this, um, I'm going to show you a couple of these uh, assumptions. An innocent one is transitivity. And uh, let's uh, take this, uh, this symbol here uh, uh, to denote that uh, the agent strictly prefers outcome X to outcome Y. And transitivity means that for all um, outcomes X, Y, and Z, we have that if the agent prefers x to y and y to z, then the agent must prefer outcome x to outcome z. And this is, this is uh, quite uh, plausible. Uh, you can uh, design, um, let, let's say, uh, psychological puzzles that, that uh, uh, tend to cause people uh, to uh, not uh, 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 obliged to transitivity, but, 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 but there are, are good normative arguments why one should have transitive preferences. Uh, not having it would mean to have uh, like uh, circular preferences, such as preferring tea to coffee and coffee to, to hot chocolate and hot chocolate uh, to tea. Uh, and I, if, if I had such uh, preferences, uh, such circular preferences. You could actually um, use me as a money pump by giving me a glass of, uh, a cup of coffee, offering me to, uh, for a small fee to switch it for uh, hot chocolate and then offering to switch to tea and so on in a circle. And, and you'll get me to pay arbitrary amounts of money, which would be, um, that, that shows one disadvantage of not obeying transitivity. There are other arguments too. I think this is, quite compelling. The somewhat less innocent assumption uh, is uh, continuity. Uh, and the agent is said to respect continuity if for all x, y, and z uh, that are um, uh, preferentially ordered in this way, the agent prefers x to y and y to z. We also have for sufficiently small epsilon that uh, the convex combination of x and z that puts uh, probability at most epsilon uh, on z. So most of the probability mass here is on x. Uh, uh, but it should the agent should prefer this combination to y. 
so it's a kind of stability here. If you prefer x to y, then you still do it if you perturb it by sufficiently. Right? Typical uh, continuity condition in mathematics. And also the same thing at the other uh, end here, where, where you perturb z a little bit with a little bit of x, and you should still prefer y to y. So um, if you think about this uh, for a minute, uh, you'll find it plausible. And if you think about it for another minute, maybe you'll think of counterexamples, uh, such as the following. Let's say x uh, is the outcome of having $1,000 in your pocket, and y is the outcome of $999 in your pocket. Those are very close outcomes. And z is that you die. So uh, many would argue here that uh, one should not, uh, in such a situation, uh, for any epsilon, prefer a con convex combination of $1,000 and death to having $999. But I think that uh, contradicts, uh, contradicts how we lead our lives. You can imagine a situation where uh, you want to get a newspaper, you can buy the newspaper for a dollar, uh, or you could cross the street uh, and um, get the newspaper for free on the other side of the street. And, and uh, what one typically does in such, such a situation is one crosses the street, even though there is an epsilon probability that crossing the street uh, will get you killed from being run over by a truck uh, or something. And we, I mean, we make these decisions all of the time and there are examples from the um, ongoing pandemic uh, that, that, that illustrates this, this very clearly. So, so I think that uh, this assumption too is, uh, it, it's not as clear cut as the transitivity assumption, uh, but it's still uh, quite plausible. And these, there are other assumptions too, uh, uh, but, but uh, I'll, I'll just stick to these two examples. Uh, they, uh, you can derive them uh, that you need to have a policy of choosing given background information B and the available uh, uh, action space uh, uh, A, that you choose the action that maximizes utility. And you can, I mean, there's great flexibility in choosing utility function, but, but there is some utility function such that uh, you should um, uh, choose the action that maximizes expected utility given the combination of A and B. And here I have a kind of funny um, hook arrow symbol for the combination. What does this symbol mean? Uh, that's actually uh, a, a deep question. So I will come back to that at the end of the talk. Now I'll go on and discuss uh, artificial intelligence, which has been another uh, major interest uh, of mine in the last few years, and it's especially the ethics and uh, futurology of, of artificial intelligence. I'll begin here with a few quotes from some of the world's uh, leading thinkers, uh, or at least thinkers or players. Here's Vladimir Putin in 2017, saying that artificial intelligence is the future not of Russia, but for all humankind. Whoever becomes the leader in this way will become the ruler of the, of the world. And you can think what you want about the truth of this statement. I think there's a good deal of truth in it, but, but I'm really worried that uh, this type of thinking sets the agenda in the AI sphere because I, I think it introduces a race dynamic, which is, which is quite dangerous. Uh, my main concern here is that uh, it will cause actors to rush forward in the race to, to uh, gain market dominance and world dominance in a way uh, that causes them to, to downplay the need to, to uh, consider social consequences and uh, safety and so on. So that's Putin. There's Jeffrey Hinton. Uh, he's one of the world's leading AI researchers and, and one of the people who co-invented um, the deep learning uh, technique that has become so powerful in this last decade. Hinton said, 
in 2015. I think political systems will use the technology I, I helped develop to terrorize people. But I still carry on. I could give you the usual arguments, but the truth is that the prospect of discovery is too sweet. And I think that he, he, what he does here is he's unusually honest in displaying kind of inner motivation that, that researchers have. Uh, uh, that, 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 I mean, you want to solve your research problem and so on and, and not think too much about uh, social consequences. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the lesson to learn from this is that society at large should not just hand over uh, the questions of, of, of the ethics of, of science uh, and the technologies to the scientists and to the engineers. Uh, because, I mean, there are examples from, from, from the Manhattan Project of, of, of similar things and, and, and uh, other examples too. Then we have Nick Bostrom, a Swedish-born Oxford philosopher, who said in 2018, there's a long distance race between humanity's technological capability, which is like a stallion galloping across the fields, and uh, humanity's wisdom, which is more like a foal on unsteady legs. And uh, I, I, I very much uh, uh, like this description. And um, as you maybe probably already suspect, I'm uh, rooting for the foal here, which working at an institute of technology is uh, slightly odd, but, but uh, that's what I do. Here are some uh, books from the last few years uh, covering these, uh, a range of uh, uh, issues uh, in, in um, AI, the future of AI and the risks involved and so on and so forth. Kai Fu Lee in his book, AI Superpowers, discusses the geopolitics and, and um, it's a bit of bad news for Putin that he, he hardly even mentions Russia uh, as a serious con uh, contender for, for world uh, dominance in the AI future. He hardly even mentions Europe in this case. It's mostly, in his opinion, between uh, China and uh, the United States. Um, the uh, focus of uh, economists uh, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee is on automation and uh, the, uh, what the consequences uh, this can have uh, for the employment market and, and for economic inequality and what we can do to make the transition uh, smoother and better, better for all. And then there's sociologist Shoshana Subov uh, and her book from last year on the age of surveillance capitalism, which is uh, about uh, how we're being in the West, we're being surveilled not so much uh, by um, by the state, but more by uh, high tech companies like uh, Google and Facebook, and what this means. And our tendency to just um, unreflectedly give up our privacy uh, in return for for uh, uh, trivial uh, conveniences uh, like access to nice apps and so on. Uh, then there's uh, Alan Turing, who, um, I mean, he died in 1954, two years before the term uh, artificial intelligence was coined. So he's not usually considered to be an AI uh, researcher, but I think that he, he is absolutely one of the people who has most influenced uh, AI uh, research uh, and development. I mean, he's like the father of, of, of computer science which artificial intelligence builds on. Uh, and, and, and most of his work was very mathematical and technical, uh, but uh, towards the end of his life, he allowed himself some more philosophical uh, reflections, such as this one in a, a, a BBC uh, talk in 1951. He said the following, my contention is that machines can be constructed which will simulate the behavior of the human mind very closely. Let us now assume for the sake of argument that these machines are a genuine possibility and look at the consequences of constructing them. It seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. There would be no question of the machines dying and they would be able to converse with each other to sharpen their wits. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. 
And he was ahead of his time uh, with this. Uh, and there are a lot of stuff here that academia has picked up only in the last few decades, the last couple of decades, I would say. Um, so, so the idea that, that the, uh, the machines would somehow overtake us in, in general intellectual, intellectual capabilities uh, has only been discussed um, seriously in academia uh, after the turn of the millennium. There's also the idea that uh, once, once this uh, point is reached, uh, the machines would kind of uh, continue developing uh, on their own uh, with no additional need for human input. And, and this uh, somehow anticipates uh, the idea of the intelligence explosion or singularity based on the recursive uh, self-improvement, which is uh, an important part of present day uh, AI uh, futurology. Um, so while uh, this, these ideas were, were uh, treated a lot uh, in science fiction, it took a long time for academia to, to start taking them seriously, but now it has started to happen and I hope it will continue. This is, uh, I mean, this is an obligatory slide in this uh, context, but it's not really a good one because it gives you the wrong idea of what a machine, um, what an AI catastrophe might look like. Uh, what people in this field um, focus more on uh, than on Terminator scenarios is a thought experiment called paperclip Armageddon, which you may or may not have heard of. So, so the idea is that you have this paperclip factory, which is high, highly uh, automated, and uh, you uh, have this AI running the factory uh, with the goal of producing as many paperclips as possible. At some point, the machine more or less by accident reaches the threshold where it uh, goes into the uh, spiraling um, self-improvement uh, cascade. And uh, before the engineers uh, uh, know it, uh, it will have reached super intelligence levels and starts turning the entire planet, including us, into paper clips, maybe leaving a few areas for, for uh, rocket launch places and so on, so it can go on and turn the rest of the uh, visible universe uh, into paper clips as well. This is something that we might uh, try to avoid, uh, and a, a, lo a lot of work uh, in the emerging field of AI safety and AI alignment concerns this. I mean, this scenario is uh, uh, purposely uh, a bit uh, caricaturish. Uh, but uh, we think about work uh, scenarios, uh, some of which are, are in this spirit. There's this issue of, of near-term versus long-term AI risk, where long-term AI risk is a label used for, for the type of thing I just described associated with the breakthrough in AGI, artificial general intelligence. And near-term are all those other things treated, for instance, in, in the books by Kai Fu Lee and, and uh, Bryn Jobson and McAfee and, and so on. Um, some say that AG risk, AGI risk is a distraction and that there are more urgent AI risks to deal with. Um, I agree with part of that, but it's not either or. I agree with the need to handle a range of more near-term AI risks. We definitely should spend a lot more time than we do now on those kinds of AI risk. But, um, Suppose we do that. Suppose we figure out how to salvage privacy in a world with increasingly capable AI-based surveillance technology. Suppose we avoid an autonomous weapons arms race that would lead to a non-proliferation task orders of magnitude more difficult than for nuclear weapons. And suppose we thereby prevent terrorist organizations from getting access to swarms of insect-sized autonomous killer drones. Suppose we work out how to prevent social media from preying on our worst addictive behaviors and how to protect us from uh, being swamped by chatbots spreading fascism and helping Putin to stabilize the West. Suppose we figure out how to achieve AI assistant decision making that is fair in the sense of not discriminating based on race or gender or sexual orientation, and that we manage to agree on which one of several possible but mutual mutually uh, contradictory definitions can apply. Suppose we find the right role of human decision-making 
in a world uh, with ever more capable AI decision making tools. And that we figure out how to uh, hang on to the human in the loop idea without trying, uh, turning the human into a meaningless figurehead who carries formal responsibility but has nothing to contribute to decisions she doesn't even understand. And suppose in the slightly longer term that we work out how to handle AI automation in a way that doesn't lead to mass unemployment of a kind that, that uh, in turn uh, causes unprecedented levels of economic inequality and social unrest. And suppose we achieve gender balance and diversity more generally at AI tech companies and AI research environments, so that the full range of diverse viewpoints get to have a say in the construction of the AI systems that are increasingly uh, becoming intimate parts of our daily lives. Suppose we do all this, suppose we fix all those near to medium term problems, and then suddenly we stumble on an AGI breakthrough that kills all of us and destroys everything we value. Wouldn't that be bad? I say it would. Well, I think it would be a terrible anticlimax uh, of generation after generation of hard earned civilization uh, problems. And for this reason, I think we should not ignore the issue of how to make sure an AGI breakthrough becomes safe and beneficial to all of mankind. And after this little rhetorical speech, let me go on to say a little bit about uh, the literature on the topic of, of this extreme variant of um, AI safety. Um, a cornerstone in the literature here is Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, uh, uh, from 2014, which really defined the field as it, as it had developed up, uh, until then, and, and which is a starting point of most subsequent uh, work. I strongly, strongly recommend it. Max Tegmark, um, also a Swedish guy, um, he uh, has this book Life 3.0 from 2017, which covers a lot of the same material as Boston, but, but is in a more popular and less uh, academic way. I think it's a nice book too. Uh, as, as the entry point in 2020 to the field, I think that there is no book I would more strongly recommend than Stuart Russell's uh, Human Compatible came out uh, last fall. Stuart Russell is a computer scientist uh, at uh, Berkeley and uh, he takes a very level-headed uh, and convincing approach uh, to artificial intelligence and the problem of controlling an AGI uh, breakthrough. And he gives us the latest uh, ideas from his research group and others on how to handle uh, this problem. So there are, um, as I said, this is, this is a small but, but uh, growing research area. Uh, you can find on YouTube uh, Paul Cristiano's talk on current work in AI alignment from the EA Global Conference uh, in 2019. Uh, which I re recommend very strongly. And the entire talk is structured around this picture, which uh, systematically um, boils down, uh, 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 goes through uh, the field uh, and, and the various, um, the various uh, subfields uh, and focuses that uh, various research groups have. Another way, uh, is a slightly broader and also simpler way to categorize it is this. First, uh, it's uh, useful to distinguish between AI governance and technical AI safety. So all of the stuff that, that uh, uh, Cristiano talks about is within technical AI safety. How do we construct machines that are safe? AI governance is more like how do we, on a political governance level, make sure that these are the machines that are constructed and how, how do you organize so that all of humanity gets to reap the benefits uh, from this. Technical AI safety in turn uh, can be uh, divided into AI boxing, which is about how to uh, prevent uh, the machine from, from uh, taking over the world in a bad way, like keeping it boxed inside a laptop or something without connecting connection to the internet. AI alignment is more like on getting the uh, machine 
uh, the AI to have the right role structure so that it doesn't want to take over the world in a way that is bad for humanity. Uh, and this is the main focus of, of current research. Uh, AI boxing, I have contributed a little bit to, uh, to that field too, and, and, uh, but the, the, nothing is clear yet, but the general consensus is that this is not terribly promising yet. At most, it serves as a, as a temporary and, and rather brief uh, solution before we fix AI alignment, getting the machine to have the right goals and, um, uh, and, and values. And AI alignment in turn can be uh, divided into machine uh, learning based AI alignment, which tries to assume as little as possible about the inner workings uh, of the machine, sort of mimicking the, the current uh, paradigm uh, in AI where, where the AIs are mostly black boxes. This can be contrasted against uh, symbolic AI alignment, which is more about really understanding uh, how intelligence works and the, the algorithms needed for that and so on. And what, what I'll talk about uh, in the rest of this talk is mostly in the symbolic AI alignment field. And one subfield there uh, is, is uh, the, the researchers who, who work on, on the concept of embedded agency. And there's a wonderful paper uh, from one or two years ago by, by Scott Garibrand and Aben Dembski um, that serve, serve as this. So what is embedded agency? Well, they start by contrasting uh, two uh, hypothetical figures, Alexei and Emma. Alexei is playing a video game and everything that happens goes on in the video game. So there's a very neat separation uh, between the agent Alexei and the world he works within. And in principle, he can have the entire world in his head if he has enough memory storage and, and, and so on. Uh, Emmy is playing real life. She's a robot moving out around in real life. Uh, and uh, for her, things are much, much more complicated because she's, a, the, she's herself a part of the environment uh, that she works on. And, and for this simple reason, there's no way that she can store the entire environment in her head. And, and uh, uh, once we start uh, constructing uh, AGIs, we need to take this uh, into account because they, they are expected to operate in the real world. So one example of, of the kinds of, this is, this is a field that, that's littered with paradoxes. And, and my challenge colleague, uh, Johan Westland has a, a fable uh, which very beautifully illustrates this. It's about the peril of running a uh, red light for the hell of it. So the main character of the, of the story is a, uh, an autonomous vehicle, uh, which has not quite reached super intelligence, but it's, it's uh, quite uh, smart. Uh, and uh, of course the engineers constructing uh, this autonomous uh, vehicle wants the AI to uh, behave well. Um, and they've actually constructed a mathematical proof that this uh, vehicle will never run a red light for the hell of it. There are circumstances that it will run, run a red light, such as if there is an ambulance coming up from behind and, and uh, it needs to get, uh, get out of the way to, to leave way for the ambulance and so on. And you can think of various sorts of, of circumstances where you really should run a red light. But what the, uh, so there are specific reasons, but, uh, but uh, what the engineers have shown is that uh, without uh, such specific reasons, the uh, uh, vehicle will never run a red light. And, and since the vehicle uh, is so smart, uh, it has actually, it, it read this proof and understood it. Uh, so there's actually no contradiction in that, but the strange things start happening when the, um, this AI uh, approaches a red light and it suddenly, uh, it's, it's reminded that, that it's been proven for certain that it's not going to run the red light without good reason. So, so uh, that's the same thing as saying that if it runs a red light, there will be a good reason. 
So it realizes that, okay, so I should just, I, I can just run the red, red light here and uh, some good reason will show up. Now, Johan doesn't tell quite how his story ends. There are several alternatives. Maybe a good reason will show up or maybe it just uh, ends with a, a crash or maybe the AI finds itself unable to run the red light um, for the hell of it. We don't know, but, but in, in any case, this raises uh, disturbing philosophical questions about uh, uh, freedom, uh, free will, and so on, which seem to, I mean, it's in the machine context, but they seem to translate uh, to humans as well. So this is an illustration of the kind of problems that about self-referentiality and so on that, that show up in embedded agency. Um, so as I said, Emmy cannot hold a correct world model in her head. It just doesn't fit because her head is part of the world. Uh, so this makes some attractive convergence theorems for Bayesian agents in particular because there is the assumption, typical assumption there is that you, you approach um, the correct world uh, model. Um, but a candidate remedy for this is that she might know the right physics and initial conditions enough to uniquely specify the world. And if you do that, you uh, uh, need to have logical uncertainty. Emmy knows uh, enough about the right physics and initial conditions that in principle she can derive uh, everything in the world, but she cannot know everything in the world for, for the reasons seen in this picture. So she cannot know all logical consequences uh, of everything she knows. And the problem with uh, Bayesian ration rationality is that uh, probability uh, does not allow for logical uncertainty. Let the probability measure P representing uh, Emmy's belief, uh, that symbolized by P, probability theory dictates that uh, if A implies B, then the probability of A is less than or equal to the probability of B. And look what happens. Uh, of course, Emmy attaches probability one to the, the statement that three plus five equals A. Now, what probability uh, does she uh, assign to the uh, um, statement that Goldbach's conjecture is true? We, let's assume that she, she doesn't know the answer to this. Then we want this probability to be strictly between zero and one. But actually, it cannot be. Let's suppose Goldbach's conjecture is true. The event that it's false can be handled similarly. If it's true, then actually three plus five equals eight implies that Goldbach's conjecture is true. So therefore, because of this inequality, uh, Emmy needs to attach uh, probability one to, the, the, to Goldbach's conjecture being true. So, so there's no room for Emmy to be uncertain uh, about uh, Goldbach's conjecture, or, or more generally for her to have any logical uncertainty uh, here. So that's uh, a bit of a, a problem if we, if we um, uh, want to construct AGIs that are uh, rational uh, agents in the sense of, of basic rationality. So I promise to go back to the issue of expected utility maximization uh, and what it means uh, to choose the uh, action A that maximizes expected utility in this sense. So, so here A is the action taken and B is the rest uh, of the uh, background knowledge. And then what is this symbol? Well, uh, the simplest is to take uh, this formula to just mean uh, that we uh, take the action that ex uh, maximizes expected utility given A and B. This means to take one's own action as just another part of the evidence. And this uh, is favored by proponents of, of what is called evidential decision theory, uh, EDT for short, whereas proponents of, of what, what has become known as causal decision theory insist that this is wrong and the choice of action matters only via its causal effects. Uh, and that brings us to the very, very tricky issue of what is causality and to the uh, comic strip that I'm actually wearing uh, on my uh, t-shirt. Uh, and I'll just give you 10 seconds to ponder this, the correlation versus causality strip.
Um, I can't hear whether you're laughing or not, but I think this is, I mean, this is one of my favorite jokes. And, and what it does, it, it, it illustrates the extreme contrast between on one, other, one hand, how well thinking about causality works in daily life and how well we seem to know what it is and how increasingly difficult it seems when you think uh, philosophically about it and try to uh, define it uh, rigorously. Uh, which uh, but it's it's just uh, uh, very very hard to get one's hands on what, what causality actually is. So um, in the choice between evidential and causal decision theory, these uh, choices, uh, uh, the different recommendation of these theories, usually coincide, but not always. And and, and w one example where they don't coincide is what's uh, become known as Newcomb's problem after the physicist William Newcomb who invented it in 1960. So here's the situation. You have two boxes in front of you. Uh, box A is transparent and contains a thousand dollars. Box B is opaque and it contains either a million dollars or nothing. And you can choose to take either both boxes or just to take box B. What do you do? And this sounds like a no-brainer. Of course, you take both boxes and you get an extra thousand dollars. Well, regardless of what's in here. But here's the catch. The superhumanly competent predictor has predicted your choice and put a million dollars in box B if and only if it predicted that you would one box. That is, that you would choose only this uh, one box. Now taking two boxes doesn't seem quite as attract, attract, attractive anymore because it correlates to the event that this box is empty. Maybe you lose this one million. On the other hand, it's been decided beforehand that uh, whether there's a million or nothing in here. So depending on whether you're an evidential or causal decision theorist, uh, you make different decisions here. The evidential decision theorist uh, decides that this column is really all that matters. You want to be in this column and the action that correlates to being in this column is to one box. Whereas the causal decision theorist is not the uh, it's really already predetermined which column you're in, and, and uh, either way, it's a thousand dollars better to two box than to one box. Um, so Robert Notzik, who was the first to write about uh, this um, uh, academic publication, he noted that to almost everyone, it's perfectly clear and obvious what should be done. The difficulty is that these people seem to divide almost evenly on the problem with large numbers thinking that the opposing half is just being uh, silly. Um, so Newcomb's problem is quite exotic and, and one can argue that a superhumanly competent predictor like this uh, probably is impossible. Um, uh, one, could, one could at least uh, be um, unsure about that. But, uh, but there are other problems with, with a similar structure one is smoker's lesion. Here is uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, who did uh, maybe more than uh, anyone else uh, to the development of statistics in the previous century. Uh, but one thing he did not do so well was to have a well-grounded uh, idea about the connection between smoking and lung cancer. Um, so uh, long before all reasonable people had agreed on the causal link between these, Fisher insisted that well, maybe there's a gene that uh, uh, codes both for the tendency to smoke and for lung cancer. Uh, and, uh, let's, I mean, let's assume counterfactually that this is the world we live in, and let's assume that uh, smoking gives you uh, extra uh, pleasure to life, uh, corresponding to the one thousand dollars here. Uh, that uh, that not getting lung cancer is is much much more valuable corresponding to this one million dollars here. Uh, and uh, if you're a causal decision theorist, you know that you ha either have a good gene or a bad gene, uh, and uh, that's uh, determined. So it's, it, uh, in either case, it's a little bit, a bit better if you smoke than if you don't smoke. Whereas, whereas the evidential uh, theorist uh, will make the opposite recommendation for basically the same reason as in Newcomb's paradox. And the third variant, I'll skip over this. This is the so-called prisoner's dilemma with a twin where you're just playing prisoner's dilemma with somebody who reasons the, the exact same way that you do. Um, 
So evidential decision theory recommends actions that correlate with good outcomes, meaning one box in your newcomers problem, don't smoke in smokers leisure, and cooperate in prisoners dilemma. Uh, causal decision theory uh, makes the opposite recommendations. Uh, 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 only recommending actions that cause good outcomes. This means that uh, it recommends two boxing in newcomers problem, smoking in smokers leisure, and detecting in prisoners dilemma with a twin. And if this is not sufficiently complicated, then uh, two of the leading uh, AI alignment researchers, Nancy Yudkovsky and Nate Suarez, proposed in 2017 a third way, which they call functional decision theory, which recommends, recommends actions that, and, and here's more or less a quote from what they said, um, actions that you'd wish the algorithm that is you would recommend for the purpose of obtaining maximum value in the course of your life. And it turns out that FDT sides with EDT on Newcomb's problems and prisoner's dilemma with a twin, but sides with causal decision theory in smokers uh, lesion. So there's actually a subtle difference between Newcomb's and smokers lesion that, that causes functional decision theory to recommend differently. And furthermore, functional decision theory parts way with both evidential and sorry, causal decision theory in certain black mass situations. So it's less uh, uh, vulnerable uh, to black mass than white uh, other instances. And it makes the, a, a very weird decision that neither evidential or causal decision theory does in the variant of Newcomb's problem where both boxes is transparent. FTT is the only one that's still one box is there, which is kind of weird because if you, if you know what's in both boxes, if you know you have a million dollars here, then uh, of course it's better to take both boxes uh, than one box. But uh, FTT insists that uh, it's, it's better to have decided before to do a one box for this. So question, do you find this confusing? Uh, you should. Uh, I do too, uh, and uh, I thank you for your attention. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ulle. Uh, I'm terribly sorry about the uh, the sound. I'm hoping that the recording will turn out all right and that you can all hear it properly afterwards. Uh, please, if you have any questions, either type it in the chat uh, chat window uh, or raise your hand there's a little button that says raise hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question uh, i'm gonna start off with one question um, i've actually talked to max tegmark myself at one mm -hmm. point and uh, asked him his opinion on the, the probability that the, we will actually see uh, agi the, the uh, general intelligence uh, and having the singularity and if we will see that when are, can we expect that are we talking 550 or 500 years what is your take on that um, are we going to um, see AGI and if so when um, so uh, this our, our uncertainty about this is enormous and I think that the only epistemically reasonable approach here uh, is to embrace this uncertainty and, and accept that it can happen in five years, it can happen in 30 years, and it can happen in 100 years, or, or maybe never. My personal intuition is that uh, unless uh, uh, technological uh, development comes to halt because we destroy ourselves in a nuclear Armageddon or something like that, uh, that uh, artificial general intelligence will, will be created uh, sooner or later. Uh, but we need to be humble about timelines. Uh, I think that the main reason why we should worry about AGI uh, already now is maybe not so much that uh, it's very likely that it will happen within five or 10 years. It could happen, but probably not. But, but the, the entire uh, project of creating safe artificial intelligence uh, artificial general intelligence seems so difficult uh, that we better give ourselves plenty of time uh, to 
to solve that. So we should get started immediately. We could need the time even if it's 50 years ahead or whatever. Thank you. Um, I have the impression that, that uh, Tegmark's view is similar. Uh, it is uh, indeed. Uh, he also said that we can probably not create uh, AGI with the same methods or principles that we're currently using to create AI. We're going to need a different type of approach and a different mindset to, to create that general intelligence. Probably, which, but not even that is clear. No, no, of course not. But uh, he said that's, that's probably what we're going to need. And thus, that means that uh, the time frame becomes even more difficult to actually. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, I haven't seen any other questions. I have one more for you. You talked about how the, the boxing solution to create the security is not the best method, but rather uh, embedding uh, code in the AI. Uh, are we talking something similar to, to Asimov's three laws or how is that yeah. working? Uh, uh, probably not. If you remember uh, Asimov's uh, robot stories, uh, you will remember that most of them have some catch uh, uh, about uh, the robots circumventing these three laws in some unexpected but logically impeccable way. And this leads to surprising and sometimes uh, uh, terrible uh, consequences. And the more or less consensus view uh, in the AI alignment research environment is that if you try to ma mimic uh, Asimov's laws, in the way, not having exactly those laws, but, but just give a list of stipulations. You must do this, you cannot do that, and so on and so forth. There will always be uh, loopholes, uh, and there's always going to be a substantial risk that, uh, uh, that the, the machine will find uh, these loopholes. Um, kind of for the same reason that Nobody has yet been able to construct a tax system without loopholes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very complicated uh, problem. And therefore, uh, focus is mostly on indirect ways. Uh, having the machines on their own figure out uh, what human values are and how to, uh, how to set up its own uh, systems of regulations to achieve this. All right. Uh, and I mean, we've, we've seen certain um, AI projects that were canceled because they, they started developing in areas where we as humans couldn't really follow. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that something to actually reach for? I mean, with uh, uh, even Alan Turing saying that uh, they will start communicating between each other and sort of take off. So, so is that like a prerequisite to actually just let them go and hoping they don't go kill us? So if you want, if your goal is to construct as powerful machines as possible, uh, then uh, having them uh, uh, lift each other to, to uh, higher and higher levels uh, in this way. Sounds like a very, very good idea. But uh, uh, the, uh, if, if you don't set up the initial conditions very, very carefully with the aim to uh, getting machines that somehow work in, 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 in favor of human values, whatever that means, that, that's another problem too, that we, uh, we're not, there's no consensus on, on what the right human values are. Uh, but, but just unreflectedly uh, letting the machines initiate uh, such a, um, such a dyna dynamic uh, would probably lead to, to a catastrophe. Because, yeah. Basically because there are many, many, many more ways of uh, uh, aiming uh, for a world that does not care about human well-being compared to the much smaller space of possible values and strategies that, that do value human well-being. Thank you. I think that's all of the questions we had. So.
thank you very much, uh, Ulla, for, for uh, sharing your thoughts and ideas on AI and how to go about it. And thank you all of you who listened in. As I said, this will be available on our uh, website, uh, statistikfremelet.se, uh, as a video, so you can watch it again or show it to your friends. Uh, please remember, we have another webinar coming up in two weeks' time on um, Jan, uh, June 10th, where we will be hearing from Matthias Villani talking about machine learning and how that will affect the uh, um, area of statistics. So thank you once again. Thank you, Ulla, and yeah. I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. Bye.